Hello. Oh, man, I don't want to deafen everybody. You guys want to get the mic just right? Are we doing good? OK. OK, since I've been told this is being streamed on the internet, I need to do something first. Please bear with me. Is it that camera? Hi, Mom. <laughs> OK. Uh, let me see where we are. Paradigm shift. What? Past, present, future. This is not. OK, yeah, that is. Oh, I see what you guys did. OK, that's fine. Talking about Student 2.0 now, first of all, I want to say thank you. This is a Thursday night. It's 9 o'clock at night. We're in Dubai, and you're here listening to me. <laughs> Don't you have lives? <laughs> Second of all, I'm humbled to be here and listen to my fellow presenters. You guys are amazing, absolutely amazing and inspiring, for each for your own different reasons and your viewpoints on Student 2.0. Now, my viewpoint is a little bit different. I am a professional educator. I've got 20 years of teaching experience. I've taught primary school, never again. Secondary school, maybe again if I have gaffer tape. Um, university, I've taught in prisons. I've taught juvenile prisoners. I've taught murderers and rapists. And now I'm in university in Dubai, so not much has changed. <laughs> but what really makes this interesting is having listened to my previous instructors, I really just want to throw out my slides and just have a conversation. Now, John told me on the break, don't you dare, because I'll go off topic and everything will be horrible, so I won't. But just to be nice about it, I come at this question as an educator. Student 2.0, one of the people interviewed me as a journalist, he said, what do you think about Student 2.0? And we have to look at that, because what we're talking about is a paradigm shift in education. So I'm going to be speaking to you about education as an educator, OK? So if it's not your cup of tea, deal with it. You're stuck here until 9.30 anyways. Now, this paradigm shift is we're talking about over time. So first thing, in order to know where we're going, we have to know where we've been. So let's look at the past in education. I'm going to tell you a story about my grandfather. Smartest man I ever knew. He only went to the eighth grade. After the eighth grade, he went and worked with his father, who was a lumberjack. And he worked with him for 10 years. And then he went to war came back from war, and he went to work in construction. Again, only in eighth grade education. He was able to raise five kids, have a good life, and everything was fine. Now, I have a feeling that this story may touch some of your own families. Think about your grandparents, your parents, and the level of education that they have compared to the level of education you have. If you're lucky, your parents have master's degrees and doctorates. If you're not, your parents may not have anything. Now, when I went to school, if this thing is still working, oh, oh, sorry, my parents. My parents went to high school, saluting the flag. Isn't it wonderful? Isn't it pretty? They were told, get a trade. Become a carpenter. Become an electrician. You can raise a family. You can have a life, and everything's good and great. That's fine. When I grew up, I was told, you need to finish high school. That's a given. You're going to have to go on to university. And when you graduate from university, you'll get a good job. Now, guys, I'm older than almost everybody in here except the other instructors. You're all babies. Mm -hmm. I'm telling you, and I'm telling my kids, you need a minimum just to start the conversation. You have to be a high college graduate. And if, in fact, in order to get better jobs than a college graduate, you probably have to have an MBA or the words PhD or doctor after your name. It's just the way the system is. You have to have that piece of paper. We had that conversation, the gentleman behind the camera and I earlier. We have the experience, we have the jobs, but you need that piece of paper, that magical piece of paper that says graduate, NBA. Okay? Now, when we go from this, the present, what we need to do, so that's the past and the way education has changed. Guess what, guys? Do you know about yourselves as students? Maybe you do, maybe you don't. So first thing, did you know that the average one of you is going to read only 10 books in a year? If you read more than 10 books, please raise your hand. OK, everybody, I want you to look at the people who have their hands up. They're liars. <laughs> now, you're going to have 15 or 20 books assigned to you in your classrooms, but you don't read them. You flip through them, find what you need for the test, find what you need for the homework, and put it away. OK? But at the same time, you're going to read over 3,000 web pages in a year. And you're going to read over 3,000 Facebook profiles. <laughs> and we're not talking you know, Angry Birds or any of that. That's just Facebook profiles. Now, at the same time, most of today's young people, and I'm sorry, John, it is in bullet points. It's, guy got stuck there. Okay. But they're, at least they're, they're simplified bullet points, and I'm not explaining them to you. 
Most of you are online at least four hours a day. Think about that one for a second. You're in school. If you're in school, you're in school between six and eight hours a day. You're online four hours a day. You have to eat so many hours a day. You have to get sleep so many hours a day. In fact, if you add up all of the hours a day that you're supposed to be working, you need 30 hours in your day. This is you guys. I want you to understand that. And what makes this area really interesting, and I didn't include it in the slides, my wife studies linguistics. Did you know that the average Arab student in the Middle East reads less than 75 pages in their lifetime? Let that sink in for a second. That's not per year. That's Arabic natives of the Gulf Coast region. So if you read more than 75 pages, you're above average. Yay, way to go. Keep going, okay? Now the other one is, I can't read that, it's too far away. Oh yeah, most of you guys trust social media for your news much more than you trust newspapers and news organizations. How many of you watch Jon Stewart? Anybody in here watch Jon Stewart? The Colbert Report? Uh-huh, you go to YouTube to get your news? It's very interesting, 40% of 18 to 35 year olds in, the, in America get their news from Jon Stewart and Stephen Colbert. They're on Comedy Central. They're comedians. They trust comedians more than they trust the BBC. Think about that one for a second, guys. But let's talk about social media. This is outlining you. How many of you have Facebook accounts? OK, anybody that doesn't have their hand up, they're also a liar. Um, actually, maybe not. Right now, Facebook has 1.31 billion users. Think about that for a second. If Facebook was a country, it would be the second largest country in the world between China and India. This is the power of social media that he was talking about with an army. This is the power that you guys have at your hands. This is a funny fact and a funny statistic. Almost half of the people when they wake up first thing in the morning before they even get out of bed, take out their mobile, uh, Facebook. Actually, I should probably take a selfie. I would really... <laughs> I won't, I won't, I, I'm, I'm a little more reserved than that. But that's Facebook. How about Twitter? 1.2 billion users of Twitter. Again, the third largest country in the world. Think about it, kind of scary. Out of 144 characters, the average person tweets 300 tweets a day. YouTube, come on now. Who doesn't use YouTube? If you don't use YouTube, raise your hand. Good, there's nobody lying anymore. <laughs> YouTube, 1.3 billion users. Again, second largest country in the world. Every hour, I'm sorry, every minute, there's 100 hours of video that's uploaded to YouTube. Think about that for a second. If you wanted to watch all of that video, it would actually take you, um, an hour of uploaded video would take you a year to watch. One hour. What if your job is to go through the YouTube videos and make sure that everything is legal and legitimate? So in two minutes, you would have a week's worth of work. I'm sorry, 30 seconds, you have a week's worth of work. Think about that, okay? Now, Google. Oh, lovely, wonderful Google, Google foo. Google, as you said, you hate Google, but let's be very honest, for, for the people behind Google, let's, let's phrase it that way. Let's be honest with you. How many of you for your homework go to Google? Uh-huh, that's what I thought. Thank you for not lying. <laughs> now, the question that I asked here is, do you remember BG before Google? No, most people don't. I mean, that's, that's one of those events in, in industry things. There are 5.9 billion Google searches a day. In 2006, there were only, what is the number? Uh, 2.7 in the year. We live in a time of expanding information. And this expanding information is what colors what we're doing, and it colors your lives and impacts them around you every day. This is how it ties into being a student of Student 2.0. I didn't really give a, a full introduction to myself. My name's William Jones. I've got uh, two master's degrees, I've got four bachelor's degrees, I've got a half a dozen associate's degrees. I collect degrees like a lot of women collect shoes. <laughs> I didn't know what I wanted to be when I grow up, I still don't. Um, I'm starting up a blog that's called I'm Making This Up As I'm Going because basically I am. Uh, somebody asked me how did I get all of these degrees. I found an instructor that I loved in university and I took every class that they taught. 
And then, oh look, I've got enough for a bachelor's. Yay! <laughs> At the same time I was collecting degrees, I collected a wife and three kids. Three, dog, three cats, two dogs, and all of that at the same time. How did we do it? I have no idea. But this is student 2.0. Things about tradition are going out the window. And this growth in social media ties into the changes in society, the changes in the workplace, the changes that you are all facing. Now, there's a, a theorist named Prensky. Now, my wife right now is watching this, and I know she's screaming at the screen. I'm sorry, honey. Oh, wait, she's over here. I'm sorry. Prinsky says that people that were born after the internet used the internet much more efficiently and quickly than people that were born before it. This is reflected in our work patterns, our study habits, our lives in general. Prinsky's wrong, by the way, but that's the theory. Okay? The growth in social media. If we take a look at this, 1984, there were 1,000 devices on the internet. 1992, there were a million devices. 2008, there was a, the first billion, and guess what happened about two weeks ago? The number of mobile devices that can connect to the internet exceeded the number of people on the planet. Think about this for a second. I kind of mentioned this when John and I were talking. This is the most powerful tool in human history, and you have it in your hands right now. With this tool, you can access libraries. You have more information available at your fingertips than any humans before you and any humans after you. You have more com computer power in this than NASA used in 1969 to send men to the moon. Why aren't you using this in your classes? Why aren't your teachers using this? I used to teach in uh, Sharjah, I won't name the school. Um, as a high school instructor, that's why I told you with gaffer tape again. Um, and I would teach my classes, and I would have the students break out their mobiles. They'd be using Twitter, they'd be using Google, they'd be using Wikipedia, and the principal would come in and scream at me at least once a week. You're not teaching. I would scream back, you're not learning. Okay? We need to understand this. Whoa, I hit the wrong button. There we go. I love that one. I just had to stick it in there. Or this one. I am smiling. I had fun once, it was awful. This is how social media impacts us, but the other thing that it does is it allows us to collaborate. I have people that I work with that are all over the world. I only see them through the video camera. This collaboration that we have tonight is brilliant because you're hearing from different people's perspectives on what it takes to be a student. Some of you may want to move into the, the physical fitness training, and I love how you're using Napoleon Hill and Zig Ziglar and the other um, uh, motivational speakers. I love what you've done. Brilliant. You found a need and you filled the need. John, you're just fantastic presenting. <laughs> 16 years old on stage with Jesse J. Amazing. And a young person who's doing, I'm going to say charity, I know it's not a great word, but social consciousness and activities. This allows us to bring all of this together on this stage, in this building. Amazing. Wait, wrong, I keep hitting the wrong button. This isn't like mine. Now, all of this is important because we live in the, inter the information age. Right now, the top 10 jobs in 2014 did not exist in 2004. Think about that for a second. The top 10 jobs didn't exist. Right now, 65% of all primary school children, it's believed, will have jobs that don't exist when they graduate from university. I love this quote. We're preparing students to work in jobs that do not exist, to take on problems that we don't even know we have. That's the world that you're in. That's the world that Student 2.0 is in. And this comes into other things else. Oh, I'm sorry. U.S. Department of Interior. Did you know that you're going to have 15 or 20 jobs by the time you're 35? You're going to have four careers by the time you're 35? 35. What do you think about that? One out of five people have been with their current company less than a year. One out of every two people have been with their current company less than five years. Now, you were speaking earlier, are you happy to be in a company for 20 years? A lot of people are. My parents' generation, that's what they said. Get hired for a company, work for that company for 20 years, retire. Guess what? It's not gonna happen. Not for any of you, not for me, the world has changed. What you need to have is information and the access to the information. 
This is what you're hearing in schools. How was your first day of kindergarten? It was horrible. They don't even have Wi-Fi. Okay? Access to information, the ability to process that information is the key skill that you have to have. And in order to get that skill, you've got to move forward into the future. You've got to be student 2.0. To be honest, you probably got to be student 3.0. Now, oops, that got put out of order. Why'd that get put out of order? The benefits of having this are huge. All right? Degree holders have lower unemployment, higher lifetime wages. Oh, wait. Degree holders, university. We're talking bachelor's, master's, doctorate, or even just a simple certification. Any one of those increases your chance of employment, increases your opportunity for wages, and opens other doors for you. It's that paper. We got some. My school, we're a new school. Two years old, I've got 40 students in a bachelor's program. But we've been running MBA programs for seven years. We have over 8,000 graduates in the UAE. We currently have 4,000 students enrolled. These are people that have worked their whole lives who realize they need that piece of paper. They need that degree. The number one selling point for an MBA, during the global financial crisis, 2007, unemployment around the world was about 22%. If you had a master's degree or above, unemployment was 3%. Think about it. You need to focus on knowledge. Now, do you have to pay to come to a wonderful place like Money Paul University? I'm sorry, I'm going to say this. No, you don't. But you need the information. And you need to be able to demonstrate the information. I want you all to know about open education. If you haven't heard about it, you should check into it. You can take classes from Harvard, Stanford, MIT, Oxford, for free on the internet. The same classes that people pay $100,000 a year to go and sit in. But you need knowledge. That's where you're going. That's what we're doing. Okay? During the course of this presentation, by the way, I'm just going to finish it up with this. There were 1,000 hours of videos been uploaded to YouTube. Some of it's this. Some of it is cat videos. Maybe corgi videos. 9,000 new websites have been created. 1.4 million tweets have been written. Most of them by my mother, probably telling me that my tie is off. 700,000 songs have been downloaded illegally. This is the world we live in. You either need to change and adapt and move with it, or it'll leave you behind. With that, I want to thank you very much for coming out to the TEDx event and coming to see me and my fellow presenters. I don't know if these guys want to say anything, but I would like to give them a round of applause, by the way. Thank you. And then there's me. Who do I give it to? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. I was wrong. I had a couple of quotes. Kofi Annan, knowledge is power, information is liberating. Actually, this is my favorite one. Knowledge is power. Power corrupts, study hard, be evil. <laughs> and last, if you don't know who Helen Keller was, she was a woman who was born both blind and deaf. She was raised until as a teenager as an unruly person that nobody could reach. So when she says knowledge is power, actually, yeah, knowledge is power. So it's about what you know. Now you guys, now we're finished. So now I'll give this to you. Are you going to take it? Okay.